Well, hey there, idiots. Welcome back to Observe. In today's video, we're going to be analyzing the nonverbal communication of Nanny Doss. For those of you who do not know who that is, I will explain a little bit just after we run the intro here. All right, for those of you who do not know, Nanny Doss, known as the Giggling Granny or the Jolly Black Widow, projected an image of a cheerful woman, but beneath the facade lurked a dark history of murder and mayhem that unfolded over decades. Born in 1905 in Blue Mountain, Alabama to Jim and Louisa Hazel, Doss's early life was marred by an abusive father and a traumatic head injury at the age of seven. Growing up in a household where education took a back seat to farm chores, Nanny sought solace in romance novels and magazines, particularly the Lonely Hearts column. At age 16, she married Charlie Braggs, and their union resulted in four children. However, the marriage disintegrated amid an abusive mother-in-law and mysterious deaths of two children in 1927, attributed at the time to food poisoning. Doss's second marriage to Frank Harrelson initiated through a Lonely Hearts column ironically lasted 16 tumultuous years. During this time, she likely committed her first confirmed murder by brutally murdering her newborn granddaughter and two-year-old grandson. Harrelson himself fell victim to her deadly concoctions in 1945, though his death was initially attributed again to food poisoning. Lonely Hearts ads continued to play a sinister role in Doss's life. Arlie Lanning died under suspicious circumstances in 1952, and Richard Morton faced a similar fate after marrying Doss in 1952. Her mother and sister also succumbed to sudden deaths during this period. The final victim, Samuel Doss, faced a different motive. Not abusive or alcoholic, he limited Nanny's reading and television choices. Her attempt to poison him failed initially, but she succeeded with an arsenic-laced coffee after his return home. In 1954, Samuel's death marked the beginning of Nanny Doss's downfall. A suspicious doctor convinced her to allow an autopsy, revealing lethal levels of arsenic. Arrested in 1954, Doss confessed to murdering four husbands, but denied harming family members. Subsequent exhumations confirmed arsenic or rat poison in her victims' bodies, suggesting a potential toll of 12 lives, including family. Attributing her crimes to the earlier mentioned head injury suffered in childhood, Doss earned the moniker Giggling Granny for her laughter while recounting the murders she had carried out. Surprisingly, her motive wasn't financial gain. Instead, it stemmed from a warped desire for the perfect romance, influenced by the romance magazines she avidly consumed. Facing charges across multiple states, Doss received a guilty verdict in Oklahoma, but narrowly escaped the electric chair when declared insane. Incarcerated with a life sentence, she initially expressed contentment, but later lamented her fate. Interviews during her two years in prison showcased her cheerful demeanor and even jokes about her case. Despite her request for death, Nanny Doss continued her life sentence. She died in 1965 from leukemia, leaving behind a chilling legacy as one of the most prolific female serial killers in history. Her life, marked by a twisted pursuit of romance and a trail of death that she left behind, remains a haunting chapter in criminal history. And in today's video, I'm going to be analyzing the nonverbal communication of some very rare footage of an interview with Nanny Doss. I think that's enough of the background. Let's go ahead and dive into the actual footage. Nanny Doss, how many girls are in the women's side at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary? There's 31 on my side and 26 on the colored side. I'm gonna go ahead and pause here and make note of a few things. One, the audio is a little hard to track. I had to clean it up as best as I could. It was very poor quality, obviously, due to the age of it. So you're gonna hear some issues with that. I apologize in advance for that. Now, speaking non-verbally as to what we're seeing emoting from DOS at this time, we're seeing a smile that is gently reaching her eyes and it is still going across her face as well. Now, whether or not it's lopsided, I'm having difficulty determining at this point. 
there could be the possibility of more action coming into one side of the mouth than the other, indicating contempt or that moral or intellectual superiority. But during this time, I don't really see that coming out. What I am noticing is that she is doing the very classic breaking eye contact off to the side to be able to recollect a certain data stat that he's looking for here. And there is a, a, a theory in nonverbal communication analysis that is centered around directional IQs where a person looks means that they're falsifying information or they're recalling auditory or visual sort of information. And while that has some proof in certain cases, it's not universally known. I don't know that that works with Nanny here. So I'm not going to use that as part of the, oh, she's definitely recalling something that's incorrect or something that's false. All that we do know is that she does break eye contact to be able to recollect this certain amount of information. And that would be considered synchronized. Let's keep watching. Do all the girls call your nanny? Uh, most of them call to my mama. Mom? Yes, sir. May I call your nanny? In the that's family? right. Where were you born, Amy? Hmm? I was born in Alabama. And Did you have a large family? I had four sisters and a brother. Were you rich? No, sir. So something that I find interesting about her consistent nonverbal posturing is this light look out of the corner of her eye that's usually centered around suspicion. If you see anybody give you like a side eye, that's where that's coming in here. So this calculated form of look that has a level of suspicion to it and she is continually locking locking eye contact with the interviewer himself so all of these means that she's at least in control of what she's presenting here she's calculated she might be a little bit suspicious of the situation but she's also maintaining this smile that does partially reach her eyes and the fact that that has stayed consistent throughout is curious to me i'm not sure why that smile would be consistently in place now Regarding her history, her upbringing, it could make sense as a mask that she uses to be able to protect herself, especially if she feels unsafe in an area or something along those lines, she might revert back to this smile state, which would be uh, a very effective pacifying gesture for whoever she's around. So that could be the case. It's only a possibility. There's not enough to be able to go off of, off of this little blip right now to be able to say that, but it is definitely prevalent and we're making note of it as we continue forward. Farming. Did you work in the field? Yes, sir. How long? All my life. How old were you when you first got married? Sixteen. And how many times were you married? Five. Why? Are so far, all of these responses are consistent, one after another, after another, after another, and she doesn't have any of these areas where she's breaking eye contact to recollect like she did at the beginning, where she's trying to remember number of people and where they were. During this time, she's staying locked in the entire time and answering very quickly, just very promptly. She knows the answers to these questions. There's not any digging about that she has to do. For some people, that can be an indicator that they have rehearsed their, their answers. They know what they're going to answer no matter what the question is, so they just got to blurt it out. That doesn't seem to be the case here. Also, according to all the research that I did in the background before this, these answers that she's giving are accurate answers. She's not trying to blow smoke at this point. She's just simply stating some of these stats. So with that in mind, as she's continuing through this little interview session here, if we're seeing that sort of pattern pop up in other areas where it may be more questionable, well, then we might be able to rely on that being more synchronized based off of her own nonverbal patterning that we've already established here. And I'm still, it seems as though her expression might be frolicking around the edges of being contemptuous. And if that's the case, that moral or intellectual superiority would definitely fit into what she's being accused of and the mindset behind it. Let's just keep watching. Why are you in the penitentiary now? All the claim back there on the husband. Which is your last husband? Yes. Mm, interesting here. So now while he's saying, you know, like, why, why are you here? Now we're seeing the eyes start to divert a fair bit, not in the way that we saw earlier with her recalling some form of information or data stat, but she's looking down and off to the side and she says that they claimed I killed my husband. And then we can also even see after that, just a small little pulling of the corners of the mouth down to the side. That small expression there can be related to the fear emotion. So if that's the case, if she's feeling a level of subconscious fear in regards to this, there's a little bit of difficulty holding eye contact with the interviewer in this area differently than the rest of the area, then that would be considered a red flag. You would want to be able to continue to hone in and focus in on that area. Let's continue watching. Did they say you killed any more? Yes. Are there other husband? Which other? Three of them. 
They do. No. Okay. Uh, fascinating. There are three of them. Does a lip lick in there. Now the lip lick and the dry swallows, things along those lines, that's an indicator of agitation in the vein of nervousness. Very common to see, especially in just general public speakers. You can even hear it start to happen as the mouth dries out and there will be more clicking in the sound of their words as they're talking. So that could be the situation there. Now what's more telling to me is when he clarifies, well, did you? She continues to look down and then she has a pursed lips, tight lips smile in there. So the pursed lips and the tight lips means biting something back. There's something that's being held back during that. And the smile could be in direct relation to something called duping or duper's delight. And judging by the context of everything else in the case, at very least at the time, it would have been a red flag, one that you would want to be able to take a look at and hone in on and focus in on again. So let's keep watching. How did they tell you turn? They, uh, so they climbed up hard and them. But you say you didn't fart them? I didn't. That one's fascinating to me as well. So this, I didn't, when she responds, her eyes obviously look around, look around in a different area. We're looking down again, where she's still keeping this like guarded expression the entire time. However, then along with that, there is a complete and total freeze of the rest of her face. I didn't. And this is a spike in her verbal processing that has been different from all of the other answers that she has given. It's very short, very brief. There are some nonverbal flashes around that that are suspicious. That I didn't would be something that would, again, serve as a red flag, considering all of the context around it. That would be an area that you would want to try to pick away at a little bit. So another fascinating thing, let's just keep watching. Uh, at the time you were convicted, was there a lot of talk in the newspapers about that conviction? Yes, sir. What did they say? Oh, they said all kinds of nasty things. You think they were his wife? No, sir. Do you still maintain that you did not poison your, either your last husband or anything else? I certainly do. Uh, <laughs> Again, I certainly do. We're seeing a breaking of eye contact. Looking down, having difficulty holding that eye contact, we're seeing a lip lick in there as well. However, what I will give them in the vein of authenticity and synchronization is that they do a small nod in there. They're nodding in affirmation as to what they haven't done, possibly. But with the other two little fiddles in there that seem to be suspicious, that would be a red flag for me. Again, and now, so, so far, as every time that this question has been presented, centered around these killings, the poisonings that she carried out, she has shown consistently a group, a cluster of red flags centered around that. So when you see that repeated cluster around a theme like that, that is a huge indicator for you that you want to be able to pursue more, that you want to ask more questions for in a way that doesn't raise suspicion of the person being asked, but might make it more difficult for them to keep all of their narratives straight enough while lying about the various things. Obviously, people were pretty suspicious in general at the time, there was still a lot to be able to learn and grow and understand in regards to that. Let's just keep watching. Uh, Manny, what would you like to have more than anything else in the world? Well, my freedom for her. And the next I like a small TV on my room. You like to watch television? Yes, sir. What do you like? Well, I like to see a, a good story. I like science. You can get a sign in. Do you read preaching? Yeah. Why? Do you listen to preaching sermons within the prison wall? Yes. About music? I listen to, I listen to all kind of music. What kind of music? I hate it. Well, I really like the hillbilly music. How about the rock and roll, Elvis Presley music? Well, I don't feel very much about it in the How about the younger girls over there? And they ain't it very much. All right, so during this entire conversation about like what she would like, what she wouldn't like, her music choices, TV choices, etc., we're seeing a pretty consistent posturing that's happening throughout that. And then as she starts to talk about rock and roll, which you may, may not like nearly as much, she's starting to have some difficulty, but you can't see it on camera. You can only see it via the movement of her arms. You can see that perhaps some manipulators are coming in as you can kind of see her arms and shoulders starting to move a little bit. And those manipulators, those self-soothing gestures, or a sign of agitation often done subconsciously by people to calm themselves down in stressful or anxiety inducing situations. So seeing that pop up there, that just lets us know again that she will in fact perhaps emote some when she's talking about something that she doesn't appreciate or that she doesn't align with. In this case, it's something so small as rock and roll, but it is something that we want to make note of. Outside of that though, she's continually keeping this guarded expression as she's studying 
this person who's interviewing her, and it feels as if all of her answers are quite calculated, and that is largely due to her nonverbal communication. Let's keep watching. Getting back to the reason you were convicted, uh, who do you blame for that? No, sir. Why? Well, I didn't know anything about it, and no, well, but Tyler told me to go down and say guilty on this green. Do you think it's valuable for people to have some knowledge that's long? I certainly do. Chief is like her. I certainly do. How long would you be in prison? That repetition, I certainly do. I certainly do. That sort of exact verbatim repetition isn't something that naturally flows in English language like that. It's not commonly done unless it's trying to hammer home like a certain point. So you could see that happening a lot in areas that people are being deceitful. They'll try to verbatim say the same thing over and over and over again to hammer home that point without straying from the message of it. It's a little stilted, a little awkward. So that is a low level, just verbal patterning red flag for me to pay attention to. Outside of that, we're still just noticing the same guarded expression with the occasional slips in of these smiles, which again, it is dancing around the edge of contempt. It does line up, but it's not a fully fledged expression of contempt that we're seeing here. So it's just something that I want to make note of as I'm kind of picking it up throughout the entirety of this interview. There's not a ton left. Let's keep watching. All right. Would you ever get out? Uh -huh. What would you do if you get out? I would take my daughter's children and put them all four together and try to raise one. What sort of a living would you try to make? What would you do? Well, I don't know anything except in housekeeping and farm work. What do you do over in the women's side of the prison? I work in the laundry. All right. I'm in Washington. Do they pay you any money? No, sir. Except they want to wash the girl. If you could, uh, Say something to people on the outside, say a mother who has a teenage daughter. What would you tell her about raising that daughter? I'd tell her to go to church and keep her close by. You think love is important today? Yeah. Thank you very much, Nanny Dot. Thank you. There's a lot of difficulties around that. That's the end of the interview there. So throughout this, what I will note Non-verbally speaking, she keeps this guarded, calculated, perhaps contemptuous expression in regards to the person asking her questions. We saw multiple red flags on almost every single hot point throughout the interview. Anytime that there was a level of suspicion or consequence around the question, we're seeing eye blocking gestures, we're seeing a diversion of eyes, we're seeing lip licks, we're seeing lip compressions, we're seeing contempt smiles, we're seeing pursed lips, we're seeing a whole slew of nonverbal activity around those things. So then during that, if I had been there, there would have been more than enough red flags to be able to continue cycling back around to this person. This person would not be clear to go. It does still allow us in times like this for we can go back and study some of the nonverbal communication of some of these prolific killers and people with just different, different psychological processings to be able to pick up their nonverbal communication, see how they present physically as, a, as opposed to what they're processing psychologically and hopefully learn the patterns from that and go from there. And as we continue to go through the annals of true crime, that will be able to continue to grow and build as a knowledge base. So that is my little analysis on Nanny Doss. If you would like to be able to see any other specific true crime analysis, let me know in the comments section below. You can also reach out to the socials or if it's not true crime, if it's literally anything else, celebrity drama, YouTube drama, I don't know, I'm going to be doing some stuff on supernatural things, with ghost huntings, perhaps even some things with people who are hunting Bigfoot, just to see how many of these people are being genuine, or at least believing what they're saying themselves, as opposed to just blowing smoke for the sake of perhaps a little bit of attention. So let me know if you have any other requests in the comments below. You can become a member for the channel if you want to. You can hit like, subscribe, and do all those things that everybody else always says to do. But, but without further ado, that's all that I've got for the day. My name is Logan and you have been oh so awesome as you always are. And I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.